Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As you've heard, I'm going to discuss temporal changes in the quality of stroke prevention using the results from Garfield AF. So let me start by reminding you that the first regulatory approval for NOAC therapy took place in 2010, which was shortly after the onset of the Garfield AF registry. Now, of course, we have four NOACs approved in different parts of the world. Garfield AF for recruited recent onset atrial fibrillation, two weeks on average from the start of the atrial fibrillation, but up to six weeks. The enrollment in Garfield did not depend on having a high chads vas score or a high Hasbled score. And patients from the five cohorts that have been followed in this report were uh, assessed at one year of follow-up. Now, I'm going to deal with four issues. Firstly, the prescribing of oral anticoagulants over time and across the globe. Secondly, appropriate and inappropriate prescribing according to ESC guidelines that were operative at the time. Thirdly, the impact of uh, dosing with recommended and non-recommended dosing levels on outcomes, and the impact of discontinuation of oral anticoagulants on outcomes. So first of all, let's take a look at the baseline characteristics of patients enrolled into Garfield in the five respective cohorts. And here you can see that there are some changes. For example, less Europeans were enrolled as the cohorts increased. More Asians were enrolled. Cardiologists were responsible for more patients in the higher cohorts and care, primary care for less. Stroke, previous stroke, uh, victims were, were less frequent in the later cohorts, and coronary artery disease was more common. Now, you've already seen this image that shows us how the use of NOAC therapy increased between 2010 and 2016. Note also that antiplatelet monotherapy decreased but there's still a residue of about 20% of patients who take this. Vitamin K antagonist therapy fell, but still an important proportion of patients are taking vitamin K antagonists. There remain about 10% of patients through these cohorts that receive absolutely no antithrombotic therapy. Let's just have a look at what's happening around the globe. In 2010 to 2011, Garfield was not operational in every one of the 35 countries. And the country which was in the lead at that time was Canada. You can see that in many parts of the world, NOAC therapy had not really commenced. But by 2015-16, you can see that a very high proportion of patients were treated with NOACs, particularly in North America as a whole, in Australia, and in much of Western and Northern Europe. Some parts of the globe were still using very small uh, proportions of patients who were treated with, uh, anti with NOAC anticoagulants, such as Argentina and South Africa. If we look at all of the countries in cohort five, that's the latest cohort, we can see that some European countries were reaching between 70 and 80% of all new starts taking uh, NOAC drugs. At the other end of the scale, we can see that many Asian countries and some European countries, Chile, China, Hungary, India, and Thailand, were still only using a very small proportion of NOAC therapy between 5 and 10% of cases. But let's have a look at some examples. So in the middle of this slide, you can see the whole world data that you've been looking at so far. On the left is Japan, and you can see that NOAC treatment is very common in Japan. Aspirin treatment is very rare, and so too is treatment with vitamin K antagonists. But a relatively large proportion of patients are still receiving 
no antithrombotic therapy. In Chile, you can see it's a completely different situation. Throughout the collection of data, which spans from cohort two to cohort five, you can see that vitamin K antagonist therapy has not moved very much, and NOAC therapy is between 10 and 15% of patients. If we move now to look at antiplatelet therapy used in these patients, it's obvious that in China, a very large proportion of patients are treated with antiplatelet drugs, predominantly, of course, aspirin, but there has been a slow increase in the use of anticoagulants and a very slow increase in NOAC therapy. In India, we can see again that there has not been very much change in the pattern of anticoagulation use. There remain 20% of patients not treated at all, and the majority of patients are treated either with aspirin alone or with aspirin and an anticoagulant. If we look now at the population divided by their stroke risk, as assessed by the CHADSFAS score, this is a relatively low risk group with a score of zero or one. And we're looking at data from Europe, divided on the left into northwestern countries within Europe, and on the right, central, southern, and eastern countries. And you can see here that the use of NOAC drugs was relatively slow in Europe, but by cohort five, about 70% of all the patients were taking NOAC drugs, and about 12% were taking aspirin. The remainder were taking nothing at all in this low-risk group. You can see in central, southern, and eastern countries that the use of anticoagulation has not changed very much, although NOAC drugs now predominate over vitamin K antagonist therapy. The important statement, however, is that a very high proportion of these relatively low-risk patients do receive anticoagulants in all parts of Europe. If we uh, look now at a higher-risk group of patients, CHADSFAS score two or more, we can see that in Europe the anticoagulation rate has remained above 80%. We can see, too, how the use of NOAC therapy has increased at the expense of aspirin monotherapy or vitamin K antagonist therapy. In central, southern, and eastern Europe, the situation is very similar, except that more patients are still treated with vitamin K antagonists. Now, I'd like to turn to a consideration of guidelines. These are the 2012 European guidelines. Essentially, all patients with a CHADSFAS score of two or more were recommended for anticoagulation, and all patients with a CHADSFAS one score were to be considered for anticoagulation. A CHADSFAS score of zero meant that no antithrombotic therapy was needed. If we look at uh, the situation with regard to CHADSFAS score on a worldwide basis throughout the whole experience in Garfield, we can see that almost 50% of CHADSFAS score equals zero are anticoagulated. And this increases in the higher CHADSFAS score range to about 70% of patients who receive anticoagulation. Now, it's of some interest why patients, particularly CHADSFAS score two or more, who should receive anticoagulants, are not anticoagulated. Our analysis illustrates that patients are more likely to be anticoagulated if they have permanent or persistent uh, atrial fibrillation rather than paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, or if they have vascular disease, take alcohol, or have hypertension, whereas those less likely to be treated are those who have a history of bleeding and who come from other parts of the world than Europe. Now, looking at an analysis of the guidelines themselves, dealing now only with oral anticoagulants and eliminating the patients who received aspirin alone or no therapy, you can see the use of vitamin K antagonists, uh, factor 10A or direct, uh, direct thrombin inhibitors or no therapy at all in the low, intermediate, 
and high-risk groups as specified in the guidelines. If we look at the forest plots on the right, we can look at the stroke risk, the uh, ischemic stroke, major bleeds, and mortality. The low-risk group, of course, should not receive anticoagulation, and this is the result in those who did not receive anticoagulation versus those that did. And we can see that there's very little deviation from the line of unity. These are very uh, low-risk patients for both stroke and for bleeding, and not very much happens to this group. If we then look at the intermediate risk group, we could divide the analysis into those who receive no anticoagulant or the reverse, those who received an anticoagulant. The guidelines give us no way in which to choose between our treatment uh, choice in this particular patient group. We can see that those who were treated with no anticoagulant had a trend towards a larger, higher stroke rate and did not have major bleeds. The mortality was a little higher than, though, than in those who received oral anticoagulants. If we look at the high-risk group, here we see some very positive advantages. The ischemic stroke and systemic embolus rate was well down and statistically positive. The major bleed rate was not much affected, and the mortality was very much reduced, with about a 50% reduc relative risk reduction. We can analyze the data in another way, now by including the compliance with aspirin guidelines, so that patients, for example, who have uh, peripheral arterial disease or coronary artery disease could also be treated with aspirin. And you can see that if we include this analysis, the, uh, again, the low-risk group are not much different according to whether they are or are not compliant with guidelines and aspirin use. The intermediate risk group are rather better treated if they are compliant with aspirin guidelines, meaning no aspirin except for those cases where it's justified. And the oral anticoagulation, as you can see, adds significantly to the response rate, but it isn't statistically significant. The high-risk group, again, shows a definite reduction in ischemic stroke and systemic embolism and in mortality, and now there is almost a statistically significant increase in major bleeding. Looking now at how we try and summate this information, we can look at a composite endpoint, for example, CV mortality in ischemic stroke, or an even broader one, including also major bleeding. And we see in the low-risk group, according to the 2012 guidelines, with both of these composite endpoints, but particularly the one that includes major bleeding, that the low-risk group trend is trending towards more bleeding in if they're given oral anticoagulants with or without uh, aspirin as appropriate. If we look at the intermediate group, when anticoagulated, there's a strong trend towards a reduction in the composite endpoint in both assessments. And if we look at the high-risk group, all of these composite assessments are positive, irrespective of whether aspirin is added to the mix and irrespective of whether major bleeding is included within the composite. Now, I'd like to turn to NOAC prescribing patterns as you are aware, several pharmaceutical databases in particular have demonstrated that not all patients seem to be receiving the recommended dosing of NOAC drugs. Here we were able to look at some 10,417 patients from the 35 countries in Garfield AF, and we could use the recommendations as appropriate for each country. When we did that, we found that there was less use of low dose and very little use of high dose NOAC therapy. For example, with rivaroxaban, 21% of patients were taking a non-recommended low dose and 6.6% a high dose. With the bigger tran, it was only 15% and 1.2%. With the pixaban, however, it was rather higher at 28.5% on the low dose schedule. <laughs> 
If we try and look at who these patients were, we can see that the non-recommended low dose was predominantly or largely attributable to elderly patients. And if we look at the non-recommended high dose, giving too much anticoagulant, it was because of renal impairment being ignored. What were the results from the recommended and non-recommended dosing? And here you can see the only statistically significant finding was that low-dose therapy was associated with an increase in all-cause mortality with an adjusted hazard ratio of 1.5. This was certainly not due to a higher stroke rate or a higher major bleeding rate because the low dose was certainly associated with a reduction in major bleeding. It remains unknown why this finding appeared. Now, when we look at the issue of discontinuation, we can see that the high rate of discontinuation was in the first four months of therapy and that it decreases after that. Altogether, 44% of the discontinuations occurred during the first four months of the start of treatment, and approximately 10% of patients discontinued oral anticoagulant for at least seven days. When we looked at the outcomes associated with discontinuation, and this is only a small part of the analysis, we can see that the hazard in these patients, even after adjustment, was very high for death, non-hemorrhagic stroke, systemic embolism, MI, for death, non-hemorrhagic stroke, and SE, for death alone, for non-hemorrhagic stroke and systemic embolism, or for myocardial infarction. So discontinuation certainly identifies a group that is at very high risk. And if we look at the analysis of who discontinue patients, those with a higher risk had a history of bleeding or some moderate or severe kidney disease, tended to have paroxysmal rather than persistent AF, tended to use antiplatelets more, and had a higher risk care setting like an emergency room compared with an office. Lower risk of discontinuation was in elderly patients those with a history of stroke, those with a history of hypertension, those with increasing BMIs, and those with permanent atrial fibrillation versus persistent atrial fibrillation. So I'd like at this point, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, to conclude with these five statements. NOAC therapy has increased in most parts of the world and is now the most common antithrombotic therapy in most countries. The adoption of NOAC therapy has been very consistent in most parts of Europe, but there remain very large intercontinental variations. Therapy, according to the ESC guidelines, successfully reduces stroke and mortality, but tends to increase major bleeding. Inappropriate dosing is associated with adverse outcomes, but underlying comorbidities are in part responsible. Dose discontinuation is associated with adverse outcomes, but it's related to paroxysmal atrial fibrillation or significant comorbidity and the use of antiplatelet agents. Thank you very much.